I asked a question yesterday on, on Facebook, and in just a moment I want to begin with prayer and I want to give an update on, on Pastor Jose, but I asked a question on Facebook yesterday that you might have seen. Uh, what is the best fatherly advice that you have ever received? And I didn't know whether I was going to get good stuff, bad stuff, what I was going to get, and I got some really great uh, responses from people in our church and from people around the country. One person said that their dad told them, don't burn your bridges behind you. That's pretty good advice. Another dad said, repenting to your children is not a bad sign of parenting. That is really good advice. Moms and dads, learn to say I'm sorry, learn to admit it when you make a mistake. You've probably heard this, if something is worth doing, it's worth doing Oh, come on, you knew that one, right? If something is worth doing, it's worth doing right. Uh, someone else said that their dad said, never question the Lord. I love that. It was actually, their dad was Spanish speaking and their dad said, nunca cuestiones al Señor. Never question the Lord. Dr. Hill's dad taught him to never step outside without your wallet and your keys. Isn't that right? <laughs> So, just he's got his wallet. If you want to go to lunch today, he's willing to do that. Good pastor friend of ours, Russell Johnson, just around the road. Russell said his dad said, and we know his dad, Rudy. Rudy would tell him, never say yes to sin and never say no to God. Isn't that good? I love that. Never say yes to sin and never say no to God. Vic and I were trying to remember some of the things that, that our dads had said. And one of the things that we both remembered that our dads told us was this, listen to your mother. Remember your dad telling you that? Listen to your mother. My dad used to tell us that all the time. And, and probably one of the things that my dad said to me that I stuck with me, it's not even spiritual, it's just my dad always reminded me that nothing is ever free. That, that, that's such a great advice because, you know, when you get that phone call and the person says, hey, I got a great deal for you. You can get this free. I always hear my dad in my ear saying, nothing is ever free. Look out. Nothing is ever free. But quite frankly, the best advice that I received from my father was not what he said. The best advice that I received from my dad was how he lived. I, I'm so thankful to have grown up with a Christian dad who, who loves Jesus. Thankfully, he's still alive today. I spoke to him last night. I'll speak to him later today. A dad who loves Jesus, who not only told me the way I should go, but he lived it. I, I have memories of waking up and seeing my dad with his Bible in his hand. We used to pray together as a family. Uh, what great memories. We would kneel down, and, and of course, it would be my mom and then my brother. I have a twin brother, Bruce, who's in the ministry, Bruce, and then my sister, Debbie, and then me, and then my dad, and we would pray one by one. Mom would start, and then Debbie would pray, or Bruce would pray, and then Debbie would pray, and I would pray, and my dad worked long hours like many guys, and by the time we got to dad, there were times that he'd be sound asleep, and we'd have to, <laughs> we'd have to just give him an elbow and say, okay, dad, it's time for you to pray. But, but I am so thankful for a godly father. I realize today that all of us experience Father's Day differently. You might be here today and you have a dad like mine that was a tremendous example for you. He loved you. He cared for you. He pointed you in the right direction. And today you have wonderful, beautiful memories of your father. Cherish, the, cherish those. Maybe you're here today and you had an absent father. Maybe he was physically present, but he was emotionally absent. He's, he was spiritually absent, kind of an absent dad. I realize some of you here today had abusive dads. You had dads who not only weren't there physically and spiritually, but dads who abused you. And Father's Day's tough for you. I get that. And I know some of you here today didn't have a dad at home. You grew up in a home in which mom was both mom and dad. And so Father's Day for you is difficult. And so I realize today that Father's Day is different for all of us. For some of us, it's a day of great memories. For some of it's a day of 
not so great memories. But I want you to realize today that whatever your earthly father situation is, and we have a variety of earthly father situations, whatever your earthly father situation is, please know that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a heavenly father who deeply loves you. You have a heavenly father who protects you. You have a heavenly father who provides for you. And you have a heavenly father that gives you the counsel, that gives me the counsel that we so desperately need. That's what the passage that we're studying talks about today. Kind of titled the message, 10 words from one father to another. God the father giving his advice to us. Before we read the passage of scripture, would you pray with me today? And let me ask you to pray today for Pastor Jose. Um, Many of you know Jose Santiago, who's our executive pastor. He pastors our Spanish ministry. 10 days ago, he had his first eye surgery, had a detached retina. They went in and did emergency surgery. Four days later, they had to go in and do another surgery. There was liquid and there was blood behind the retina. And he's in this process of long recuperation. Last night, he had a really difficult night. He's in pain and he's uh, just struggling, sleeping. And if any of you have had that, I've spoken to some of you who've had that, that's a difficult recovery. And so we need to pray for Jose today. So would you bow your head and your hearts and, and let's pray together and let's, let's uh, pray for Jose and, and thank God for this day. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to meet together as, as your family. Well, we pray for our friend, we pray for our brother, we pray for our pastor, Jose today. Lord, I pray that you would help him to sense your presence, your peace in his life in a very palpable way. Lord, even at this very moment, I pray that you would relieve him of pain. I pray that you would help him to be able to rest. And God, I pray that he would be on the road to recovery, such a vital part of our ministry. He ministers to all of us in so many different ways. He ministers to me. And so God, I pray that you would be with him. Lord, thank you for our church. Lord, thank you for what you've done through the years here at Hollywood Community Church. And thank you that you continue to raise up leaders in our church, leaders that are gonna impact not only our community, but leaders that you're sending around the country and leaders that you're sending around the globe. We thank you for that. And Lord, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would encourage us from this very familiar passage of scripture. Help us to hear from you in a very special way. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse one. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Exodus 22, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For the Lord your God, for I, excuse me, the Lord your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children. Well, that's kind of a scary statement right there. God says, I'm a jealous God, and I visit the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. But I show steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. Made it holy. Honor your father and your mother 
that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's car. You shall not covet your neighbor's boat. You didn't see that in there? It says that. All right. You shall not cover your neighbor's television who is larger than, which is larger than yours. You shall not cover his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. We know these verses. Very familiar to all of us. They're known as the Ten Commandments. If you're here today for the very first time, we've been walking the last six months through the book of Exodus, and we've seen, and we'll see again in this passage, how God miraculously redeemed his people, brought them out of Egypt, and now as they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, God communicates to them. And God begins to share with them his expectations, not just a list of rules because he's a mean God, but a list of expectations that is going to help them to live a happy, joyful life. I've given you a couple of interesting facts about the Ten Commandments that you might or might not know, but the Ten Commandments are the only portion of Scripture said to be written by the finger of God. That's such an interesting, two times in the Old Testament, it says that these commands were written by the very finger of God. In Hebrew, the Ten Commandments are often referred to as the Asaret a Devarim, or simply the Ten Words. We call them the Ten Commandments, but the Hebrew term for these commands is literally the Ten Words, or some translate them the Ten Phrases. I thought this was interesting. More than 60% of Americans cannot name half of the 10 commandments. If I sat you down and I grilled you this morning and said, okay, name for me the 10 commandments, how many could you name off? I asked Vicki that at seven o'clock this morning. I'm not gonna tell you the score she got, you're gonna have to ask her. She did better than the majority of Americans, I will say that, huh? She did better. The Ten Commandments are extremely important to us. And yet at times, they're a great plaque on the wall, but I'm not sure that you and I in this day and age truly understand how they relate to our lives and how that by following them, we can truly experience the blessing of God, the blessing of citizens of God's kingdom. So I have three simple points that I kind of want to pull out just as an overview. And for the next 11 weeks, we're going to be studying the, de- the Ten Commandments as we go through this summer. And so we're going, to, we're going to walk through them. We're going to take each one individually. But this morning, I kind of want to just pull back just a little bit and do a little bit of an overview and see two or three things as we look at them as a whole, how they apply to us. So if you have your outlines in front of you, the first thing that I said is this, the 10 words clearly present the gospel. You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I I don't see it. 10 rules that we're supposed to live by, how do the 10 commands or the 10 commandments, the 10 words present the gospel? Well, it's interesting that the Hebrew version of the 10 words or the Hebrew version of the 10 commandments does not begin with verse three as our version does. As a matter of fact, if you would see, you know how you see the the tablets and and the 10 commandments are there and the first one would be, uh, you know, you shall have no other gods before me. The Hebrew version doesn't begin in verse three. The Hebrew version begins in verse two. Verse two says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. As I thought through that, I wrote down in my notes, this is so very important, catch this. We talked about it last week, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. But God called the Israelites to obedience only after he redeemed them and brought them out of Egypt. Catch that, I wanna say it again, it's important. God called the Israelites to obedience only after he redeemed them, he rescued them, and he showed them his great love. 
The average American, maybe the average person here today, we view God as kind of like this angry God up in heaven who has this list of commands that he wants us to obey. And if we don't obey those commands, he's kind of looking down at us, disgusted at us, because his ultimate goal for our life is that we obey those 10 commands. But quite frankly, that's not the way he presents these commands in the Old Testament. His first response to the Israelites was not to call them to obedience. His first communication with the Israelites was to call them to redemption, was to rescue them from the slavery that they found themselves in. As I, as I wrote that out and I thought about that, I wrote down in my notes, what a demonstration of grace. What a tremendous demonstration of grace. If I were God, I would have done it completely different. If I were God, I would have showed up in Egypt while they were still in bondage and said, okay, here's the deal. I have the power to rescue you. I have the power to redeem you, but I wanna make sure this is worth my time. And so are you going to obey me or not? Because if you're not going to obey me, I might, as not, I might as well not waste my time in rescuing you. So here's a contract with 10 rules that I'm going to give you. If you're willing to sign this contract, then guess what? I'm going to come in and put all these plagues on the Egyptians, and I'm going to rescue you and redeem you in a miraculous way. Are we on the same page? That's the way I would have done it. But that's not the way God did it. God reached down in grace. God reached down in love. He heard the cries of his people who were in bondage, and he redeemed them. He rescued them before he ever called them to obedience. We saw this last week, but it's so very important. Grace always comes before the law. Redemption always comes before obedience. We have a tendency to get that wrong. We have a tendency, we want people to change. We want our kids to change before they come to know Jesus. We want them to live like us, and we need to realize that we cannot change ourselves. We cannot change them. Only the power of the gospel can change someone. So here's the second truth that I wrote out. Like the Israelites, God frees us by his grace. God gives us new life in Christ. And then he calls us to obedience. Quite frankly, it's a, it's a little bit of a waste of time to try to get an unbeliever to obey the Ten Commandments. Now, now, it's a great foundation for our society. It really is. But the only way that you and I can obey the Ten Commandments, the only way that anyone can obey the Ten Commandments is through experiencing the grace and the power and the provision of God. We desperately need his grace before you and I can ever be obedient. So we said last week we have a tendency to kind of want to invert the order. We want someone to change before they give their life to Christ. That is not the way God works. Let me remind you of a verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things are become new. He doesn't say, become a new creation, put away the old things, embrace the new things, and then you will be in Christ. That's not what he says. He says, if you're in Christ already, the old things then pass away, and everything becomes new. Catch this, church. Salvation is not the result of obedience. Obedience is the result of faith. Can you say that with me? Did you catch that? That's really important. Salvation is not the result of obedience. I know that's a long phrase. Maybe you can't say it with me. All right, listen to me as I say it again. Salvation is not the result of obedience. Obedience is the result of faith. Faith always comes First. It's so important for us to see that even in the Ten Words, even in the Ten Commandments, God demonstrates the gospel before he calls the Israelites to obedience. Here's the second thing that I want you to see in the passage. The Ten Words or the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the law of Christ. 
Often I have people ask, and it's a really legitimate question. They ask the question, Pastor Brian, do, do New Testament believers have to obey Old Testament laws? Wait a second, Brian, I thought we were under grace. If we're under grace, are we still under the law? And if we're under the law, are we really under grace? Did Jesus fulfill all of the Old Testament law? Those are great, legitimate questions that we kind of want to flesh out in the next few weeks. But before we answer those questions, notice a couple of things about the Old Testament law. By the way, I know it's a little warm in here. Anybody just a little warm? Here's what I want you to do. We're going to play a psychological game, all right? Turn to the person beside you and say, I am freezing. Turn to the person beside you and say, okay? All right, turn to the person on the other side of you and say, brr, I'm cold. Can you do that? Okay. Don't you feel a lot better? It's cooler in here, isn't it? It's a lot cooler. All right. Where was I? All right. A couple of things about the Old Testament law. The first is this. The Old Testament law had three clear divisions. Let me just mention these quickly. The first division was the ceremonial law. And you probably have wondered this as you've read through the Old Testament and you've, and you've heard all these different laws, especially in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. So you back and think, man, how do all these things apply to us? Well, there were three types of laws. The first was the ceremonial law. Uh, they were made up of laws governing the temple worship and the way to approach God. What type of sacrifices the Jews had to bring to the temple. The, the various dietary restrictions the religious feasts that they had to observe. Those were ceremonial laws. When they came to the temple, at times they had to bring a lamb without spot and without blemish. And I mean, there were ceremonial laws that they had to fulfill. Here's what I want you to catch. In Jesus Christ, all of those laws have already been fulfilled. Let me show you a verse in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. The writer of Hebrews says this, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify the, for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Those sacrifices, they were great. They served a purpose for a period of time, but those sacrifices only covered sin. They did not remove the guilt of sin. That's why every year they had to bring another lamb to the sacrifice, year after year, decade after decade, lamb after lamb to cover the sin until Jesus Christ came, the spotless lamb of God without blemish. And he offered himself as a sacrifice, not only for the sins of the Israelites, but for our sins. He offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews says, once for all. Not covering sin, but removing the guilt of sin. Aren't you glad when you came to church today we weren't selling lambs out front? Aren't you glad that Dr. Hill wasn't there with a great big machete and on, you know, on an altar and say, okay, put your lamb right there. Let me cut his head off, all right? Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? We don't have to do that. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial law. It's important for us to understand that. The civil law, the second thing, the civil law covered specific uh, laws for the nation of Israel. What happened if you accidentally killed your neighbor's cow? All right, that that was laid out in the civil law. How were the Israelites supposed to handle debt? How were they supposed to build their houses? How were the Israelites supposed to dress? What clothes should they wear? Those were civil laws that applied to the nation of Israel. Now, sadly, in time past, we've taken those civil laws and we've tried to apply them in this day and age. They do not apply to us. Why is that? Because in Jesus Christ, we are neither Jews nor Gentile. In Jesus Christ, we now form part of a brand new nation. And so this morning, we gather together as a church made up of people from all over the world. And we are a one nation. We are one kingdom under God, under Jesus Christ, who already fulfilled all of those civil laws. 
And so today, you and I are no longer under the civil law. We're not bound to them. The third aspect of the law was the moral law. The moral law reflected the holiness of God. These were laws that revealed the nature and the will of God. A good example of the moral law is what we're studying. The 10 words are the 10 commandments that demonstrated God is a holy, righteous, pure God. And they demonstrated his holiness. And God expected his people to reflect his holiness. Like the ceremonial and the civil laws, Jesus completely fulfilled the moral law. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? There is only one person in the history of civilization who lived their entire life and never violated one of the Ten Commandments. There is only one person in the history of the Jewish nation who lived their entire life and never violated none of the 613 laws that the nation of Israel had set aside. Jesus was absolutely perfect. He fulfilled every single one of them. So how does that reflect, how does that relate to us? Let me show you the words of Jesus and the words of the New Testament. Matthew chapter five and verse 17, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. So here's what I want you to catch today. This is, this is deep stuff. Put your thinking hats on, okay? This is deep stuff. Although we are lawbreakers, look to the person beside you and say, I'm a lawbreaker. All right, you might not want to say that, but you are, all right? I'm not saying that you, you know, broke the speed limit on the way in. I'm not saying that, you know, you robbed a convenience store before you came to church, but, but I mean, we are lawbreakers, although we are lawbreakers. And by the way, you might sit back and say, man, Brian, I don't know whether I agree with that. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you break one of the laws, you have violated all of them. And so although we are lawbreakers in Jesus we become law keepers. Although we are law breakers in Jesus, we become law keepers. Look at the person beside you and say, I'm a law keeper. All right? Now, don't start bragging. You did nothing to become a law keeper. You did absolutely nothing. Jesus did everything for you. Let me show you a couple of verses, Romans chapter eight, verses three and four. Catch this, please catch this, catch it on the screen. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Notice, catch it, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So here you are, a lawbreaker who is a sinner, who has violated the righteous rule of God. The law shows that you're sinful. But here comes Jesus Christ, the perfect law keeper. And by placing our faith and trust in him, the righteous requirement of the law is not only fulfilled by Jesus, but it's now fulfilled by us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So maybe you're scratching your head saying, okay. So does that mean the 10 commandments doesn't apply to us? Does that mean Christ already fulfilled them so I can lie and then stand before God and say, hey, I claim the honesty of Jesus Christ and I can steal and say, hey, you know what? No, Jesus was perfect. No, no, no. Listen, that does not mean that you and I do not have to live by those standards. Notice how I said it in your notes. Although the Mosaic law was completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the moral law was renewed in the law of Christ. 
Let me say that again. Although the Mosaic law was completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and though Jesus is the end of the law to you that believe, and here's what this means. Being in Christ, one day you will stand before God. But let me just say it this way. I'm going to stand before God as a liar. I'm going to stand before God as someone who has had bad thoughts. I'm going to stand before God as somebody who has demonstrated anger. But when I stand before God, God doesn't see any of those imperfections in my life. Here's what he sees. He sees the sinless, stainless blood of Jesus Christ who was shed for me. And so I fulfill the law, not because of my perfection. I fulfill the law because of Jesus Christ. As a result, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. As a result, I know I'm going to heaven, not because I'm a great guy, not because I'm a wonderful pastor, not because I'm a fantastic preacher, and I'm all three of those things, but I'm not going to heaven because of any of those things. I'm going to heaven because of Jesus. And I have standing, I am righteous because, not because of me, but because of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled everything. Notice how, Notice how Paul talks about the law of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 21, Paul says, For though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being under the law myself, that I might win those that are under the law. Verse 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but notice how Paul describes himself, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Here's what Paul says, I have a burden for Jews who are still living under the Old Testament law. I have a burden for Gentiles who have no idea what that Old Testament law is. And Paul says, I have a desire to reach both of them. How? By submitting myself to the law of Jesus Christ, that I might win both. What's the law of Christ? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, Paul says this as he begins to flesh it out one more, a little bit more. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill, what does he say? The law of Christ. Church, this is, this is deep stuff for us to grasp, but although never specifically defined in the New Testament, the law of Christ is presented to us as the holiness of Christ demonstrated by the love of Christ. Let me say that again. The law of Christ is demonstrated by the holiness of Jesus Christ demonstrated or lived out by the love of Jesus Christ. Here, here's what that means, and let's, let's simple it down to its smallest common denominator. We are truly like Christ when we live like him and when we love like him. So, so you can sit back and say, okay, yeah, but what are the list of rules that I'm supposed to abide by? Here's the way you're supposed to abide. Live like Christ. How am I supposed to talk? Here's the way you're supposed to talk. Talk like Christ. How am I supposed to love? Here's the way you're supposed to love. You are supposed to love like Jesus Christ. The law of Christ is to recognize that I serve a holy, righteous God who perfectly fulfilled all of the law. He's my example, and now I obey him, not out of obligation, not out of fear, not out of necessity, but I obey him because he loved me. He gave himself for me. He redeemed me. He rescued me. And out of gratitude, I sit back and say, man, I want to be just like him. I want to be just like Jesus. I want to live like him. I want to love like him. And so the 10 words, the 10 commands are reiterated in the law of Christ. As a matter of fact, we're going to go the next few weeks, we're going to look at all of these, and you're going to find these spoken about in the New Testament. So it's not like Paul is saying, throw those out, let me start something more. He takes those and he reiterates those, sometimes in a little bit of a different way, but he reiterates those in the New Testament. Let me show you one more thing as we, as we pull it to a close today. The third thing I wrote in my notes is this. The 10 words serve as a moral compass for us today. The 10 words serve as a moral compass for us today. Have you realized it? We live in a world that's 
on its way down. We live in a world that's not getting closer to God. We live in a world that is getting farther away from God. We live in a world that that is no longer using God, his word, holiness as a compass for living. As a matter of fact, anybody who sits back and says, man, I want to live in a way that honors and glorifies God. I want to be faithful to my wife. I don't want to view pornography. I want to be honest in what I do. The world looks at that as kind of more like an oddball. I mean, why would you want to live that way? And the reason we want to live that way is because that's the way God is. And as Christians, we are reflections of Jesus Christ. So so here's here's what the moral law is, the Ten Commandments is for us. It is this moral compass that points us in the right direction. That's what the ten words are. Now here's what I can't... Here's what they point us to. You say, okay, Brian, where do they point me? North, south, east, west. Here's where the Ten Commandments point you. Catch this. They point you to Jesus. That's where they point. They point you and me to Jesus. If the Bible is all about Jesus, and I think we as pastors have erroneously taught for years that the Old Testament is about the nation of Israel and the New Testament is about Jesus. The Old Testament is about law. The New Testament is about grace. And so if we're not careful, we can kind of put a division between Old Testament and New Testament, not spend much time in the old, spend all the time in the new because we're living under the dispensation of grace. Here's what I want you to catch. Every word in this book is about Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the focus of this book. And everything in this book points us to him. If that's the case, then the Ten Commandments are all about Jesus. You say, Brian, how is that? Let me give you two simple ways. The first four commands reveal Jesus' identity. The first four commands reveal Jesus' identity. They tell us how we should relate to God. We're going to flesh this out in the next few weeks. Because of who God is, he alone is worthy of our worship, our affection, our commitment. Why do we make the effort to get up on Sunday mornings and come and worship together? Why do we do that? Because he is worthy. Why do, why do we give back to him a portion of that which he's given to us? Because he is worthy. Why do we lift our voices and sing when we don't have good voices? Because he is worthy. The first four commandments talk us about his worthiness, his identity. There is only one God. Serve him. The last six commandments then reveal Jesus sanctity. They reveal his holiness. Because of his holiness, he tells us how and why we should relate to others. Why, why, why do we tell the truth? When he says, don't bear false witness, why do we not lie? And why do we tell the truth? Oh, because God told me I'm not allowed to do that. No, that's not why we tell the truth. We tell the truth because God is truth. And so whenever I tell an untruth, I am being unlike Jesus Christ. And so the more truthful I am, the more like Jesus I am. Why shouldn't we murder? We don't murder, why? Because every single human being was made in the image of God. And we reflect that and we honor that. Listen. The Ten Commandments is a moral compass that points us toward Jesus Christ. So here's the last thing I said. I'm I'm done basically, I know you're hot. There is no better handbook for successful fatherhood than the moral law revealed by God the Father and fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So today, here's what we wanna do. Dads, would you stand? Dads, grandpas, great-grandpas, would you stand all around the auditorium? Would you stand? Dads, man, man, look at this great group of dads. Let's give them a hand today. Dads, we honor you today. Somebody made a statement, stay standing because our ladies are giving you a small gift. Someone made a statement and it's true that on Mother's Day we honor the moms and on Father's Day we get on the dads. That's probably true, but but dads, we honor you today. Dads, thank you for your leadership. 
Thank you for providing for your families. Thank you for protecting your families. Thank you for being the man of God in your home. Thank you for being a man of integrity. Thank you for being a man of honesty whom your children can look to with respect and they can emulate your life. Guys, today we honor you, we celebrate you, and we challenge you to be the men of God, to be the men that God desire for you to be, men whose lives are characterized by the identity of Jesus Christ and the sanctity of Jesus Christ. You know what our country needs? You know me, I'm so apolitical, it's unbelievable. We don't need another political party. Here's what we need. We need men who are gonna stand up and say, I'm gonna be a man of God. I wanna point my family in the right direction. This wristband that we've given you simply says this, man of God. And we have on it 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, in which Paul says this, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. All of those things are emulated and mentioned in the Ten Commandments that we're gonna study in the next few weeks. So guys, let me challenge you, be men of God, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue steadfastness, and pursue gentleness. Realizing one day you will stand before God and you will give an account, not for how much money you made, not whether your kids wore designer clothes or not, not whether you sent them to the best colleges and there's nothing wrong with all of those things. You will stand before God and you will give an account for the type of leader, husband, and father you were. May God help us to be men of his word. Ten words from one father to another.